There's this theory out there that annoys most Trekkies, being that of the films only the even numbered entries are any good. This stems mostly from the fact that everyone remembers Star Trek V The Final Frontier as being the worst movie of the series, and ignores that Star Trek The Motion Picture, while divisive, was a hit and so was The Search for Spock. However, Star Trek V The Final Frontier is indeed a bad Star Trek movie. And guess whose job it is to make it right? And in this episode of Revisited, we're going to look at exactly what went wrong with something that was clearly a passing project for its star and director, William Shatner. So unnecessary. Jump back to 1986 and Star Trek IV The Voyage Home was a significant hit. It was the highest grossing movie in the franchise and earned critical raves. People that didn't even like Star Trek were down with this earthbound adventure of the crew of the USS Enterprise, and the franchise was riding a new, renewed wave of popularity. Don't tell me. You're from outer space. No, I'm from Iowa. I only work in outer space. Oh, well. I was close. On the small screen, Star Trek The Next Generation, after a rocky start, was starting to hit its stride, and the original series was reissued on VHS. People were loving the franchise, with it arguably at its peak of popularity around this point. Please, Captain. Not in front of the Klingons. While the obvious choice would have been to hook Leonard Nimoy and franchise vet Nicholas Meyer for more entries, Nimoy was suddenly red hot as a director. His follow-up to Star Trek IV, Three Men and a Baby, was the highest grossing movie of 1987. Nimoy was down to return, but this time, only as an actor. Greetings, Captain. Spock! What are you doing in this neck of the woods? I have been monitoring your progress. I'm flattered. At any rate, William Shatner had been promised that he could direct the next film following a pay dispute over Star Trek IV. And like with Nimoy, him getting the gig actually wasn't all that outrageous, as he had directed plenty of TV. Shatner had a pretty strong pitch with him using the rise of television televangelists like Tammy Fabe and Jim Baker as inspiration. Jesus loves us through anything. Jesus loves me just the way I am. Jesus loves the way that I love. While now this may seem a bit out of place in a Star Trek film, it was actually very topical for the late 80s. And indeed, the show itself had always fared best when tackling issues of the day, such as the Vietnam War and racism, albeit metaphorically. What have you done to my friends? I've done nothing. This is who they are. Didn't you know that? No, I didn't. Shatner had wanted Nicholas Mayer to help write the movie, but he was busy with his next film as a director, Company Business, starring Gene Hackman. Shatner and series producer Harvey Bennett worked out the story themselves, bringing on writer David Lowry to write the script. He had previously written Dreamscape and in the 90s would become a popular writer of action movies such as Passenger 57 and Money Train. Lowry actually did a decent job with the writing, toning down some of Shatner's wilder ideas and bringing in Spock's brother, Cybok, as the evangelist character. You made that up. I did not. You did too. Cyborg couldn't possibly be your brother because I happen to know for a fact you don't have a brother. Technically, you are correct. I do not have a brother. Yeah, you see? You see? I have a half-brother. In the movie, Cyborg hijacks the Enterprise with his followers in order to essentially find God, prompting the movie's best line of dialogue. What does God need with a starship? Sean Connery was courted to play Cyborg, but in the end he opted to make Indiana Jones and The Last Crusade instead. Smart move, Sean. Rather, character actor Lawrence Luckenbull, who's actually the uncle of the Wachowskis, would take the part. Your vision, given to me by God. He waits for us on the other side. All this raised an issue, though. If you know your Star Trek lore, you'll know that Shatner, at times, was far from beloved by his supporting cast. When some of them realized Shatner would be the director, they bristled. For one thing, Leonard Nimoy and DeForest Kelly hated the script because it called for them to eventually side with Cybok against Kirk, something they point-blank refused to play. I cannot go with you. I, uh, I guess you better count me out, too. It was revised and they eventually signed on, but George Takei, played Sulu, didn't want to be directed by Shatner, who he'd always feuded with. Eventually he changed his mind, and to his complete shock, he actually found Shatner to be highly professional and collaborative as a director. In fact, everyone was impressed with Shatner's on-set skills, with Nimoy and DeForest Kelly, veterans of many television westerns, amused by the fact that they get to deliver a more physical performance this time. As the premise had the Enterprise in disrepair, meaning no transporter, thus they have to pull off a big rescue on horseback. This was Shatner's doing, as he'd always been a keen sportsman, and the film gives him ample opportunity to not only show off his skills on a horse, but also his talent at mountain climbing, with the opening of the movie featuring Kirk scaling El Capitan, although he's doubled extensively. 
perhaps because it is there is not sufficient reason for climbing the mountain. I am hardly in a position to disagree. Hi, Bones! Mind if we drop in for dinner? So if the shoot went well, what went wrong? Plenty. For one thing, there was no strong villain. Clearly Star Trek IV's success weighed on everyone this time, so Shatner and his writers worked a lot of humor into the script, particularly in the first act, when the team is on shore leave. What are we gonna say? What, Bones, what, what are we gonna say? How about Camp Town Raisin? Pack up your troubles. Are we leaving, Captain? It's a song title, Spock. As kids, when Kirk, Spock, and McCoy started singing Row, Row, Row Your Boat, I pretty much checked out. Row, merrily, merrily, row, merrily, row merrily, merrily, gently down the stream. To give Shatner his due, I think he wanted to give the supporting cast more to do, but some of the choices are bizarre, such as Scotty and Uhura kind of maybe hooking up. Also, Sulu and Chekhov are acting like Laurel and Hardy when they're on shore leave and get lost. We've been caught in a blizzard. And we can't see a thing. Request you direct us to the coordinates. My visual says sunny skies and 70 degrees. Sulu, look. The sun's come out. It's a miracle. Some of the jokes are just awful, such as Scotty's pratfall where he claims to know the ship like the back of his hand before bonking his head on a pipe. It's slapstick level stuff. However, none of this is what actually torpedoes the film. It all comes down to the special effects, which Shatner himself said in his book, Star Trek Movie Memories, were decidedly less than special. Usually, ILM was able to pull off pretty incredible effects work, but they were busy doing Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade and Ghostbusters 2. Instead, Paramount had to go to a company called Associates and Farron, which sounds like a yacht rock band from the 70s, and the work they delivered was abysmal. Part of it was due to the movie's budget, which was about $33 million. This is significantly higher than the last movie. Mainly, it was due to the fact that they only had three months to do the work, which is about half the time that they needed to complete convincing special effects. And the shortcuts they took are painfully obvious, with too much unconvincing rear projection used. They also had to scrap Shatner's action-packed climax. First, William Shatner was supposed to be chased by a Rockman in the finale, but the suit they had for the Rockman to wear was just ludicrous. Then he was supposed to be chased by a ball of energy, but the final effect was so bad it was scrapped. Now Kirk is just chased around by a villainous godhead that shoots puffs of light at him, all of which look just awful. So it's me you want, you Klingon bastards. What are you waiting for? For his part, Shatner's always bemoaned how poorly the climax turned out and has wanted to revise the ending, such as they did with Star Trek The Motion Picture. But Paramount has never approved the expense. Oh! I'm afraid I overshot the mark by one level. Nobody's perfect. Is there anything good about Star Trek V The Final Frontier? Well, it's short, that's one thing, running just over 100 minutes. It also has a good score by Jerry Goldsmith, who returns to the series for the first time since Star Trek The Motion Picture. But given how cheap everything ends up looking, some of Shatner's big directorial flourishes, such as Cybok's introduction, which is a homage to Lawrence of Arabia, feel painfully like a first-time director trying to show off. However, it should be said that Lawrence Luckinbull, as Cybok, is actually really good in the part, and Shatner directs himself well, delivering one of his loosest performances as Kirk. Jim. Trying to be open about this. About what? That I've made the wrong choices in my life? That I turned left when I should have turned right? I know what my weaknesses are. I don't need Cyborg to take me on a tour of them. In the end, the movie was a critical failure that, for some reason, seemed to take Star Trek Motion Picture's lead as inspiration, even though that hadn't really worked 10 years earlier. It has no clear-cut villain. Cybok is very sympathetic. Sure, Star Trek IV didn't have a villain, but they had that amazing hook where they went back to contemporary San Francisco. In the end, Star Trek V flopped at the box office, only grossing $49 million domestically, a worrying number for the franchise. However, it should be noted that the film also came out during the infamous summer of 1989, which was jam-packed with blockbusters, including Indiana Jones, the Last Crusade, Batman, Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, and Lethal Weapon 2. It was one of several sequels that underwhelmed at the box office, including the James Bond movie License to Kill and Ghostbusters 2. I gotta sit down. However, it did come very close to ending the big screen franchise, with series mastermind Harvey Bennett pitching a Starfleet Academy prequel starring a younger Kirk, Spock, and McCoy to the studio. Instead, Paramount, who knew the franchise would be celebrating its 25th anniversary in 1991, opted to bring the old guard back for one last hurrah, albeit with proven hands Nicholas Mayer and Leonard Nimoy at the helm. But that's a story for another time. Merrily, 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 merrily